Good morning uh, and welcome to the sixth meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I ask colleagues and others around to make sure they do put their phones into at least a silent mode that they don't interfere with proceedings? And the first item on the agenda this morning is to decide to take items three and four in private. Are members agreed? We are agreed. The second item on our agenda is to take evidence on the UK Trade Bill and the associated Scottish Government Legislative Consent Memorandum, and we're joined for this session by Scottish Government officials Graham Fisher from the Legal Directorate, Luke McBratney from the Constitution and UK Relations Division, and Stephen Sadler from the Trade Policy Team. I warmly welcome our witnesses to the session this morning. Mr Sadler, I understand you want to make a, a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Please feel free to do so. Briefly, thank you. Um, the, the UK Government has described the main purpose of the Bill as being to provide the key measures required to build a future trade policy for the UK once it leaves the EU. And the Bill is in three parts. Parts two and three of the Bill fall within reserved areas. Part one is relevant to devolved matters and along with schedules one to three is covered in some detail in the Government's Legislative Consent Memorandum. Very briefly, Clause 1 provides powers for both Scottish and UK ministers to make regulations to implement the Government Procurement Agreement. Clause 2 provides powers for both UK and Scottish ministers within devolved competence to make regulations to implement qualifying international agreements. Schedules 1 to 3 of the Bill establish and then constrain devolved competence for the purposes of the exercise of these powers along similar lines to the approach taken to Scottish ministers' powers in the EU Withdrawal Bill. The powers in the Trade Bill are designed to operate alongside the powers in the EU Withdrawal Bill. The UK Government has said it expects that in most cases, the implementation of any obligations within existing international trade agreements can be dealt with through the EU Bill. There will be certain circumstances where the, this may not be possible, and the provisions set out in Clause 2 of the Trade Bill are intended to bridge that gap. The LCM made clear that if the UK is to leave the EU, then the Scottish Government agrees the need for provisions which seek to maintain continuity in trading relationships and ensure continued access to government procurement markets. Such provisions, including those in the Trade Bill, will provide some continuity for businesses, employees and consumers. The LCM also <coughs> excuse me, made clear that the Scottish Government welcomed the powers conferred on ministers in the Trade Bill. However, the Government cannot recommend to Parliament at this stage it gives consent to the Bill as currently drafted, and the Welsh Government is taking a similar position. The reasons for the Government position on this Bill were set out in the LCM, and they're consistent with the approach taken in response to the ways in which powers are confirmed, confirmed on devolved administrations in the EU Bill. The Scottish and Welsh Governments published a, a number of draft amendments to the Trade Bill on the 18th of January. These amendments were tabled at Westminster and debated at committee stage of the Trade Bill, although none were passed. We've had discussions with UK government officials in the Department for International Trade before and since the amendments were debated, and I would expect these discussions to continue. The Secretary of State for International Trade has subsequently written to Scottish and Welsh ministers, acknowledging the links between discussions on possible amendments to the EU Withdrawal Bill and the Trade Bill. Dr Fox confirmed that the UK Government would want to reflect the outcome of these discussions by bringing forward changes to the EU Bill and that he would want to adopt this approach on the Trade Bill. Convener, it might not be possible to identify which trade agreements may need to be implemented through the provisions of the Trade Bill until nearer exit day, but it might help if I conclude by giving some brief examples. For organic products, EU regulations currently set out a list of third countries whose standards are treated as being equivalent to the EU's, making import arrangements simpler. These equivalence arrangements will be incorporated in domestic law by the EU Withdrawal Bill. But trade agreements might include requirements of their own for what is, treated, what is to be treated as equivalent. The EU's existing trade agreements with third countries will already be reflected in the EU regulations, but if anything changes when the UK develops its own trade agreements with those third countries, then there will be a need to bring legislation on organic standards, for example, into alignment. Similarly, some trade agreements, like the Canadian deal, include provisions on mutual recognition of professional qualifications. While EU law will currently be in line with those agreements, 
If anything changes when the UK develops its own trade agreements, there would be a need to bring UK law into line. In conclusion, the, the closer that any UK third country agreements are to the existing EU third country agreements, the less likely it is that the power in this bill will need to be used. We understand that the UK government has not yet identified any area where they, where they will definitely or we will have to use the power. The power is there as a backup to avoid a situation where so-called grandfathered trade agreements cannot be brought into force because domestic law cannot be updated. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mr. Sadler. That would be you know, a, a good explanation of some of the areas. Can I just try to bring it a bit closer to home in my own head about, in my own constituency, for instance, if I was a, a sheep farmer in Killin and there was a trade deal around agriculture being negotiated, <coughs> uh, currently that sheep farmer would obviously, in terms of the devolved responsibilities, would have the Scottish Government looking after the devolved elements of that. But in future, under the trade deal, that any particular trade deal that might adjust <coughs> costs or introduce new regulations or bring in any potential barriers, the, if, the, if the EU withdrawal bill stays as it is um, and therefore there's no change to the trade bill, there would be no locus in that for the Scottish Government because of these, the responsibility for that would all lay at Westminster. Would that be something the Scottish Government would find acceptable? Um. First of all, that, that, that is the correct assumption, I, I believe. And no, I don't, I don't think the government would find that acceptable. And I think that's why we've suggested, the government suggested amendments to the trade bill, which reflect the overall changes to the EU withdrawal bill. I think otherwise we will be in the position where trade agreements can be made and then um, the regulations are, are made um, in devolved areas with the constraints put on the, the, uh, the Scottish and Welsh ministers by the bill as, as present. Okay, because I'm just trying to find examples mm -hmm. of where we can bring this alive for the f <coughs> people in Scotland to understand the challenges, as, as, as you say, that the UK, the Scottish Government find the bill that currently stands unacceptable. But um, to set this in context, though, Adam, would you like to just begin a discussion around the, where this fits in international perspective? Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. Good, good morning. Am I right in understanding that this bill relates only to international trade? Yes. Yes. This bill relates only to international trade, yes. and um, and and I, I can I just you know I mean I assume that this is a relatively easy question, but just for the avoidance <laughs> of doubt, um, are we all agreed that international relations, including treaty making, including um, the making of free trade agreements, that all of those are in the United Kingdom Constitution reserved to Westminster? International trade, as you say, is reserved, but the implementation of some of those aspects is, is a devolved matter, yeah. which is why um, I think the UK government has acknowledged that in trade white paper and explanatory notes to, to the trade bill and in subsequent discussions at official and ministerial level. Yes, uh, 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 abs uh, absolutely. But as a matter of constitutional law, international relations, treaty making and international trade are reserved in full. Uh, to the Westminster Parliament and are not devolved to, to this Parliament. That's, your, that's the Scottish Government's understanding as well as mine. I think we just say that the, the regulation of inter international trade, as it, as it appears in Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act, is of course subject to the exception on observing and implementing international obligations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, and can I ensure also that we are in agreement that there is no legal requirement anywhere in UK law, including under the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, or any other provision of statute for the United Kingdom government to consult with devolved administrations or legislatures on treaty making? Yeah, yeah I mean, just to say with that, absolutely, it's the, the concordat arrangements with the, the, that require for the binding and honour only, but it's those that, that require the, the UK government to consult with the devolved administrations okay, where, so just to be, where their interests just to be, are Just to be crystal clear, we're, we're in agreement that there is no legal requirement in the United Kingdom law for the United Kingdom government to consult with devolved administrations about treaty making, including the making of free trade agreements. There's, there's certainly no direct legal requirement of things like a legitimate expectation. Okay. You know, yeah. Right, so, th so th this conversation is a conversation which is entirely about matters which, as far as UK constitutional law is concerned, are reserved to Westminster. Certainly subject to that point about yeah. observing and implementing uh, international okay, so obligations. That, of, that, yeah. that, that's really helpful, thank you. So the, that, that's the legal that's the legal background, but you know, uh, underneath that legal background, or if you want to turn it the other way around, on top of that legal background sits a whole lot of um, political uh, agreements, um, concordats, memorandums of understanding, call them, call them what you will. And the United Kingdom government has, as I understand it, undertaken to cooperate with 
the Scottish Government and indeed with other devolved administrations in the UK on negotiating and implementing treaties in general and international trade treaties in particular, is that correct? We have, we have had several um, commitments or undertakings as you described them, yes, and certainly since, I mean the UK, in terms of the trade bill for example, the um, UK Government published a white paper on trade back in October there were, there were commitments in there around consulting devolved administrations. There were also um, further commitments in the UK government's response to the consultation responses, which I think was published in the first week of January. That, re that report scattered through it had a number of high-level commitments about, talking about the need to have a trade policy which reflected the needs of the whole of the United Kingdom and therefore uh, consulting with devolved legislators, um, devolved administrations, and a wider group, yes. Yeah, and does the Scottish Government share my view that those commitments are commitments that we should welcome? We should certainly welcome the commitments, yes. Yes, good. Um, well, well, I certainly welcome them, um, <coughs> at, but, we Sorry, understand, we, but we understand that they are political commitments and not legal <coughs> requirements. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Ivan. Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, and thanks um, for coming along to talk to us this morning. It was really just to um, get your perspective on the, uh, how you see the Scottish Government's specific role as these trade negotiations move forward, um, the UK Government negotiating with EU and third <coughs> countries, um, and um, how would that kind of work, how, how much of a role would there be, do you envisage, and, uh, and how would it manifest itself? Well, given the commitments which we've just been talking about that have been made, we would certainly hope that there was full and com full and timely involvement of Scottish Government and other devolved administrations. I think there's a difference. Uh, that this particular bill is just talking about um, a particular set of agreements that are already in place and kind of rolling them forward or to, to, um, uh, making them appropriate for the UK as an independent member and not a member of the EU. Again, UK government has made expressed commitments, um, which we look forward to working with them to, to put into practice, about negotiating and involving devolved administrations in future trade deals. So, I mean, at the moment, um, I would say there isn't a huge amount of consultation going on. UK government might say they're not in a position to have many of these discussions yet, but we would certainly look forward to it in the light of the commitments that they have given in many places publicly in writing and face-to-face and -face meetings. So at the moment, or, or just to clarify, so what we're talking about here is the, um, the, the, the agreements that would replace the EU's agreements with third countries and how the UK would fit into that, that structure rather than the UK <coughs> going out and creating brand new yep. agreements which will come later. So obviously the clock's ticking um, and what you're saying is that at this stage all you've got is um, a commitment that the Scottish Government will be involved as and when the time is right. Yes, we've had some, right. uh, I think what I could describe as high level discussions okay. at, at official level yeah. about what might might be happening and, and a very general timetable, but we haven't got into any detailed discussions yet. No. So is the shape of how that would, would, would look becoming clearer or the time scale mm. when we may start to have more substantive conversations around about that being hinted at? I would hope it will come clear as soon, to be honest. I mean, okay. it's not particularly clear at the moment, to be fair, but right. um, m the discussions are, are continuing between officials in Scottish Government and UK Government. Okay, but at some point we're going to run out of time. There's a deadline on all of this, yes. Okay. Uh, issues, issues around framework in this, in these areas? Yeah, it's, it's similar ground to what um, Ivan McKee has just covered. It's obviously this idea that you need to have effective mechanisms in place for consultation between you know the UK government and the devolved administrations I guess in order to provide I suppose quality of negotiations and outcome um, more legitimate um, legitimacy to the outcomes as well which I'm sure the Scottish government would agree with so at one end maybe you've got mechanisms at the other end maybe you've got maybe more obligations mm. So I'm not sure you can answer this question, but obviously, you know, in Canada, they've got a particular way of, of organising things. You know, they've created a joint committee on trade, mm. which I suppose could be replicated in the UK, like a JMC, but for trade, um, meeting up several times a year and so on. Um, and that would be kind of at one end, maybe for active participation. And then at the other end, maybe you would just have, you know, maybe just access to texts or, um, you know, sharing of information in a timely fashion. 
does the Scottish Government have any sort of developed proposals on what type of mechanisms, mm. structures, frameworks they would like to see, or is it too early to, to I, say that? I think it's, it, it's, an, it's at an early stage, although having said that, we've had discussions at official level and between ministers where um, we have said, okay, we welcome the commitments that you're making to involve us more in these future trade deals. How is that going to work? Mm -hmm. And we've made a number of suggestions and pretty much, as you say, ranging from mm -hmm. a, a formal JMC for trade um, through to a, a more of a commitment to keep us regularly informed with the text or potentially even before then negotiation briefs and, and all of that. And, and how so has that been received, would you say? Are you getting any indication of, of where the UK government might sit between those two uh, ends of the spectrum? Not, not specifically about where they would sit. I mean, I think they've, they've said you know, they, they would welcome continuing dialogue, as they say, about how we, how we take this forward. And it's also, um, I think, fair to say that they are having similar discussions with the Welsh Government, whose mm. position, I think the Welsh Government published a paper last week from memory on trade, where they specifically recommended there should be a JMC on trade. Mm -hmm. um, so another option would be that the Scottish Government could um, spend some effort providing analysis and impact assessments for um, areas you know, that are specifically um, of interest to Scotland that they could then obviously feed through to the UK Government for, yeah. for its use during negotiation. Is that something the Scottish Government's working on at the moment? It, it is, yes. I mean, uh, the document Scotland's Place in Europe was yeah. published recently the had some, one, uh, yeah. some kind of high, some high level stuff, but it mm -hmm. is something we are continuing to work on with uh, and looking not just in government, but looking at information that might be available, for example, through Scottish Enterprise or through you know, a, a range of people are already undertaking these assessments. And I think specifically looking at individual sectors and we're looking to try and pull that together to see what, you know, to see the kinds of messages it's, it's talking about the impact, possibly impact of Brexit, either on sectors or the whole economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, before we move into areas to do with the role of Parliament, because I think that's the area we're going next, I just get in some of the more high-level context stuff that Adam quite rightly was raising at the beginning. Currently, all of the trade deals that are negotiated for the United Kingdom are done through the European Union, mm. and there are well set out mechanisms for that process, including a sign-off eventually in the European Parliament of any particular deal that's made. And there are processes available for the Scottish Government to feed into that process currently. Indeed, MEPs could be lobbied directly by their, um, you know, by their constituents to influence the outcome of these if they wished. Um, what's the Scottish Government's view on what will be lost from, that, from the process that we currently have as compared with what would be the process in future? Um, I think what, what would be lost, if I, well, if I can perhaps answer that a different question, uh, in a slightly different way, then if, if I'm not hitting the mark, I think what we would want to do is to ensure that the arrangements, once the UK leaves the EU, that are there, are, are, are actually improved on. So within the UK, there is, there is a greater role for devolved administrations in all of that. There are existing uh, mechanisms within the UK for UK government and devolved administrations to um, to talk, to consult, to discuss issues on European matters. I think we would like to see those at the very least, well, I think we would like to see those enhanced, to be honest, rather than just sort of on a standstill basis. So I, but, but I, mean, I think in terms of what, what's lost, I don't think we would want to see um, any particular level of interest or involvement that we have now diminished at all in any way by the UK government saying, well, we do we deal with trade now because there is that. I think we would need to develop a new system, a new set of arrangements for um, getting a wider involvement in trade deals, I think. And that's something that we're, we're starting to consider how we might best pl be placed out and proposals that we might put forward. Okay. Um, now, um, I think it's about more of a wider issues on role of Parliament. Patrick, you want to kick that off? Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, most of the, the comments and discussion so far has been about uh, the role of the Scottish Government, and most of the, uh, the, the memorandum talks about the role of, of Scottish ministers and the Scottish Government. Understandably, I suspect, which whoever would happen to be in office at any one time would be concerned about the, the role of government. There isn't a great deal in the memorandum about the role of parliamentary scrutiny. Um, can I ask what is the Scottish Government's understanding of, first of all, 
if the trade bill passed in its current form, what level of parliamentary scrutiny would exist, uh, obviously here, but also at Westminster? Uh, and secondly, does the Scottish Government have a view as to the changes that are required in relation to parliamentary scrutiny? What level of parliamentary scrutiny uh, of trade negotiations uh, and trade agreements uh, does the Scottish Government seek uh, to have uh, uh, set out in the, in the legislation? Okay. Um, I think in terms of the, the trade bill as it currently is at the moment, the role for the Scottish Parliament would be, I suppose, formally limited to considering the regulations that, that come forward to implement the trade agreements in devolved areas. As for Westminster, I think there, there is an existing process where Westminster, where the UK Parliament has a role in uh, trade agreements, and, and that wouldn't be changed by this. It would still be um, from the 2010 Act. Um, in terms of future arrangements, I mean, again, that's something we are looking at now, and we have a commitment to produce papers in due course on uh, suggestions for more powers in terms of trade, and I think that will look at the uh, role of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. One of the things we're looking to do in, in that paper would be to develop a consensus about ways to protect, to identify and protect any particular Scottish interest in trade agreements, and I think uh, there are international um, international precedents, mm -hmm. international comparisons, which we could usefully look at to see whether they would work in, in a Scottish-UK context. If I can raise as an example the, the debate over recent years on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, mm. uh, where a great deal of civil society involvement, political debate, uh, uh, scrutiny was, was brought to bear, and it was in many ways, European parliamentary scrutiny uh, that actually uh, made sure that some of those arguments carried the day. Now, if we're, if we're going to be outside of the European Union and outside of, uh, w without that layer of, of parliamentary scrutiny at European level, we clearly need to replicate that within the structures of s s the UK as a, 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 a multi-jurisdiction country, a, a country with, with devolved competence. Um, at which level, I mean, maybe the Scottish Government has, hasn't reached a view yet on this, in which case that, that's fine, but just please say so. At what level does the Scottish Government feel that parliamentary scrutiny needs to be brought to bear in approving negotiating mandates, for example, before trade agreements are reached, or in signing off trade agreements at a parliamentary level mm -hmm. rather than merely by ministers, whether of one or more than one government? Well, I mean, to start with, then, probably the easiest bit to say is we haven't, the Scottish Government hasn't reached a, a, a view on this, a firm view on this yet. We are looking at a number of options. As you said, there's a, there's a range, and I think we mentioned here, that there is a range of potential involvement for, for parliaments and for devolved administrations, um, including in our consideration of this. I mean, I noticed the submission from the Trade Justice Scotland Coalition put forward a lot of... Um, yeah. A lot of information and sort of suggestions about going the way forward, and I think those are the issues, among others, that we want to consider in forming a view, and then, then you know, bringing that to Parliament and then discussing that. Uh, you know, I would say in due course, but that's a, a terrible civil service <laughs> thing to say. But you know, uh, we are um, th there are deadlines to all of this. It will have to be sooner rather than yeah. later, but not today, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I, I look forward to the chance to. to debate that in Parliament if, uh, if the government's going to dedicate some time to that. Murdo? Lily? Just to continue on the theme of scrutiny that Patrick Harvey raised there, it doesn't appear that there's any scrutiny proposals or transparency within this process whatsoever, and that has to be a worry for us, and we've already heard from the opening questions that the UK government can basically force through any trade agreement it likes, whether Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland agrees or not. With that, that's hardly a recipe for mutual cooperation, given the circumstances that we're in. What's the Scottish Government trying to do to get some agreement into this, this mix so that we can work together more cooperatively to get the solutions we seek? We, well, as we mentioned before, we've had numerous commitments from the UK Government from about last autumn onwards, if not before, to involve Scottish 
government do other devolved administrations we're taking that up we're having discussions certainly at official level in due course it'll be with um at ministerial level so i think we're going to take them at their word to say they want to de in involve all the devolved nations and wider society we want to be pushing for you know discussions in the near future about what that's going to look like partly for the points that you raised for that for that kind of level of scrutiny that's in, that's important in very wide-ranging trade agreements would we be proposing a particular uh, set of arrangements to the UK government for agreement? Um, or will we I, I would think we will do, yes. You know. I mean, as I said to Mr Harvey, not, it, it, not in due course, but some, somewhere between due course and, and today, I think we will, <laughs> be, we will be coming up with, with some proposals. I love that. that. I, love that. <laughs> I love that. Thank you very much. <laughs> you had some technical <laughs> questions you wanted to raise on the, these issues, Emma? Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I am in, in, in some of the technical issues because I know that uh, we don't want the UK government to attempt to reserve powers that are currently dev devolved, such as in agriculture. And I'm sure, you know, we've had 40 years of uh, common agricultural policy and now that has to be, like, detangled. So what would be the technical challenges of coming up with a new ag trade bill? Um, the, there are, there's a range of legislation proposed to deal with the consequences of EU withdrawal and to prepare for EU withdrawal. And I think as the legislative consent memorandum makes clear, the, the principal tool which will be used is the EU withdrawal bill. I think the committee is familiar with the Scottish Government's arguments about Clause 11 of that bill and their position that EU competences in devolved areas should flow directly to the Scottish Parliament on withdrawal. Um, I think, uh, 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 as has been made clear, the, the Trade Bill is one of a range of other pieces of legislation, including the Sanctions Bill, which are directed at a more specific and narrow aspect of this, in this case, the uh, continuation of existing EU third country trade agreements. So I think the, the, the concern which you, you have raised about the, the um, continued ability of Scottish devolved institutions to have influence over devolved policy areas is one for the EU withdrawal bill rather than this trade bill which has a much narrower focus. Okay. Well, still on. Trade issues then I'll, go, I'll come to Neil at the end of Customs Union. You've got another question. Yeah, I, I wanted to, thank you, Kevin. I just wanted to ask Mr um, Sadler if he could clarify something that he said in his opening remarks. He said in his opening remarks very carefully that the Welsh Government position on the trade bill is similar to the Scottish Government position. The similar to implies it's not identical with. Um, now, we know that the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government have been working very closely together in terms of tabling amendments and so on and so forth with, the, with, with regard to the withdrawal bill. And I think you said, if I quote you right, Mr Sadler, that there, there were joint Welsh and Scottish Government amendments tabled for this bill at committee stages, at committee stage in the House of Commons. Forgive me if I've got that wrong. Um, but it, it, is, it, how is the Welsh Government position with regard to the trade bill different from the Scottish Government position? Sorry, I must have misread my... <laughs> what I've actually said here is the Welsh Government is taking the same position. The same, so OK. I right. apologise if I, if no I said similar. Okay. I, it may be that I got, I no, got that wrong. Says. Thank you very much. Um, can I just make absolutely sure, before we move on to, to, to the last issue we want to cover today, and Neil, with Customs Union. In Scotland's place in Europe in 2016, the Scottish Government made plain that it wanted to take part in any trade negotiations that impacted on devolved competencies. I, I just want to make sure that's still the position of the Scottish Government. Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I guess. And, uh, so no, sorry, go. On. When you, no, when you go. No, I was just going to say. I mean, it, it is. It, it's that. It's that overarching um, uh, view of the Scottish government that we should be involved in, in things which affect Scotland and in trade deals. Yes, there will be times. I, I think it, sometimes it might be difficult to draw a, li a very clear line between devolved and reserved issues in trade deals because there's a read across in various things and the more that um, modern trade agreements develop they're more wide-ranging and they, they, they age more into public policy issues which are more devolved so that's a long way of saying yes again yeah but some of the some of the larger areas though of these trade agreements often involve things like agriculture mm. environment fisheries yes and therefore it, it is the government's expectation I'm assuming then that in any negotiations in that regard, which impact and devolved comp competencies that you'll be fully involved? It would be our hope that we would be, and it's, it, it, that will certainly be something we'll be taking forward in discussions with the UK government about the way forward in developing future trade agreements. Yeah, but the trade bill deals with none of that, how, how, how about any of that mechanism can be actually employed? No, it doesn't. No, I mean, that, 
I think UK government has said that, that that's for the future. We're saying we need to be just having that discussion quite soon, but it's not, not in the trade bill. Well, we're basing a lot on faith then, in that case. That's just a statement. I'm not expecting you to respond to that as civil servants. <laughs> Um, Neil, Customs yeah. Union. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question to clarify uh, Scottish Government's position <coughs> in relation to the Customs Union. I understand that Scottish Government obviously want to remain part of the European Union um, and as such a member of the Customs Union, oh, Customs Union. but on leaving the European Union, is it the Scottish Government's position that it should uh, be a member of the Customs Union as currently exists or is there an acceptance that there needs to be a new Customs Union with a new agreement? I think... When the UK, if, if and when the UK leaves the EU, we won't be part of the same of the existing customs union. But I think the government's view is that we should look to be part of a customs union. Yes. Okay. Sorry, James, you got a question as well. Uh, it's separate to. No, you go. I think yeah. I think Neil's finished. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. It's, I just wondered, just in terms of the the issue of public procurement, which is obviously a, <coughs> a kind of you know major amount of expenditure goes through that in terms of trade what you saw as the potential implications of uh, under the trade bill for public procurement rules? I think, I mean, I have to start off by saying I'm not an expert in any way, well, not at all in, in public procurement rules, but, I mean, um, my understanding is that the bill, the intention of the UK government supported by the Scottish government is that we would continue to or look to be me independent members of the agreement on government procurements as a starter. That may well produce some scope um, because we won't be under exactly the same position as we are now there may be some scope for some changes procurement is, a, is at least in part a, des a devolved issue at the moment so I think we would be looking to see in the context of future discussions around uh, agreement for the UK to be members of this and Scotland as part of that we would be looking to see if there were any any changes any flexibility that we could introduce okay Okay, can I, can I thank the witnesses for coming along this morning? We are just got to just past 11 o'clock and we're a bit, bit, bit ahead of schedule. So, um, as indicated in earlier that, um, to committee members, that we'll take the, this opportunity now to go into private session to discuss items three and four, but we'll return at approximately 11.30 um, to deal with the second panel on the trade bill. So, we we'll currently go into private session.
Okay, we'll now continue to take evidence on the UK Trade Bill with our next session featuring a panel of academic experts. And a welcome to the meeting this morning, um, Dr. Billy Mello Aru Arujo. Have I got a bit of right, have I? Yeah, just about. I won't, uh, I won't hold it against you. Okay. Even my daughter <laughs> can't pronounce my name properly, so it's fine. Well, I'm glad somebody's not holding something against me today. That's great. <laughs> Uh, you're the, a lecturer, uh, Billy, at the School of Law at the Queen's University in Belfast. Right. We've got Professor Andrew Lang, I think I've got that one right, Chair in International Law and Global Governance at Edinburgh University, Professor Michael Keating, Director of the ESRC Centre for Constitutional Change, and Professor Sangeeta Karana, the Department of Accounting, Finance, Economics at Bournemouth University. First of all, I thank all of the witnesses for coming along this morning. Some of you have come a, a distance to, to help us out in our deliberations on the trade bill, so I'm very grateful for that. I just want to start with a very simple question at the beginning, though. Ask if you could describe, um, from your own perspectives, um, what you think the impact of the trade bill will be, will be on the dev devolution powers, and what do you consider maybe the implications of free trade agreements the UK may enter into for, for devolved competencies such as agriculture and the environment? I don't really mind who kicks that off. Who would like to have a go? Since I spelt your name just about right, Billy, yeah. Dr. Billy, how about you? Well, I would have, uh, I would raise three issues with respect to this trade bill, and I can go into more detail later on maybe. And those three issues would be first, its scope, rather the vagueness of its scope, uh, which could have significant implications in terms of the powers that are given to executive, the executive in terms of implementing these trade agreements. Uh, the lack of adequate parliament uh, scrutiny involved in these trade agreements, not just uh, the trade bill which covers trade agreements that are being rolled over, but also it raises questions concerning future trade agreements in a post-Brexit scenario. Uh, and the lack of any role given to devolved authorities in shaping uh, these trade negotiations, which could be problematic beca because many of the issues which are covered in these trade agreements relate specifically to uh, devolved matters. Yes, it's very difficult just to talk about the trade bill because it's very narrow in the scope and the coverage of international trade seems to be very patchy because there's bits here, bits in the withdrawal bill, bits in another bill. It makes it very difficult to see what the overall picture is. So I'll talk about trade bills, trade agreements generally. We haven't negotiated free trade agreements for about 45 years and in that time a lot of things have changed. Notably, trade deals are much wider in scope now. We have things about product standards, environmental standards, uh, labor standards, social provisions, all kinds of things, and they're getting wider all the time. That means that trade is not just about trade, it's about domestic policy. And because of that, partly because of that, trade bills encroach on devolved competences to an extraordinary degree now, but trade itself is still a reserved UK responsibility. So that raises the question of how the devolved nations fit into international trade negotiations and agreements. Thank you very much. Just a few, uh, we can get into matters of detail, of course, but just a few high-level points just to distinguish the future free trade agreements issue and the existing free trade agreements issue. In terms of future free trade agreements, I agree with my colleagues, of course, that they are, to some extent, every FTA, deep and comprehensive FTA, is a constitutional negotiation and potentially affects constitutional arrangements domestically. And I think it's, and I guess the main point I wanted to make is that I think it's reasonable to take a very ambitious view as to what the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, the, the role that they ought to, t ought to play um, in, in future FTA negotiations. I think best practice is quite a significant degree of parliamentary in involvement in a variety of different federal systems globally. Okay. And then in terms of existing FTAs, I think, there are, I think the situation is ever so slightly different. I think, I think there will be some circumstances for existing FTAs where the, where the, the um, priorities of flexibility and speed as long as there is no significant change, m m might require different arrangements. Okay, Professor. Morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much. I, I completely agree with my colleagues that the trade bill is very narrow in scope and uh, it lacks clarity. We clearly need to see a vision coming out as to where we are heading for. Most importantly, from the perspective of the Scottish Government, first thing that merits attention is what are the consequences of the change that they are proposing? Now, this is something that 
and how will devolved administration uh, interact on those issues? Second, what measures are being taken to, to prepare for a transition if we are going to have any? Because the clock is ticking away. And most importantly and thirdly, what elements would be included in future FTAs that the Scottish Parliament will have a say on or not have a say on? So I think we need more clarity here about that is my uh, take on the trade bill. Okay, can I just ask one of you if you want to have a go at giving us you know, an, an obvious example of where a, a trade bill may in future impact on uh, a devolved power, just so we can bring it alive to the audience who's out there listening to this. Does anyone would like, like to have a go at that? Is there, a, is there a, an obvious example where that might be, there might be implications for the, a devolved settlement in a future trade bill? So I'll start this off. Um, procurement is a matter that is uh, with the devolved administration, and that is some that is an area where the trade bill is going to have an impact on. Um, I personally do not s understand. I cannot comprehend how the UK is going to go about once it comes out, once it brexits. So once we have the once we have brexited. What does it mean? Are we going to then follow e EU directives? The, the fact is that the UK has actually transposed EU directives onto its procurement framework. How are they going to disentangle it? And what role is the Scottish Parliament going to play there? Are you, because for the Scottish Parliament, it's really important to start identifying what are the uh, entities that you would want included or excluded, because these are aspects that the Scottish Parliament has to start thinking about, and what role, whether you would like to give a special role for the SMEs. Okay. So we could discuss this as okay. we go yeah, along. I just, just want to get a general feel for things at the beginning. Michael? Well, agricultural support, agricultural regu regulation, mm -hmm. environmental policy, p potentially. Okay. Have, so one could look, it, it, to the extent that future FTAs involve investment chapters, um, I think there are lots of examples of sub-national authorities in a variety of countries being challenged for anything from permits, uh, construction permits, uh, regulatory permits for land use of all different kinds. Th these sorts of things um, affect foreign investments in, in a variety of ways, and, if you're, and, and one is always open to the challenge of discrimination or lack of fair and equitable treatment and so on. Okay. Okay. If, you, if you look at classic trade policy, if you look at the EU-Canada CETA, for example, it has, uh, you negotiated tariffs, low tariffs, tariff rate quotas uh, on issues like pork, seafood, beef, veal. I don't know to what extent they're relevant to Scotland in particular, but I expect beef, for example, Thank would you. be something important. Uh, if you look at the EU-South Korea trade agreement, uh, negotiations on tariff rate quotas for uh, dairy products. All of that is subject to renegotiation, and depending on what the outcome of the negotiation is, you could have more competition from Canada, from South Korea, or you know, you can have you provide more market access. So they will have an impact. Sure. And, and do you think in the trade bill, uh, 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 although it's a, a narrow bill, should be expanded to explain about what the about how the devolved government should be involved in future? I think that that should be there somewhere. I don't know whether this trade bill is the right place to do it because it is very narrow in focus. Mm -hmm. But there's been a lot of talk about frameworks generally about the relationship of foreign trade to domestic policy and how that should be dealt with. But it's been dealt with in a very fragmented way. We don't have any clear principles and we don't have any clear doctrine as to the role that the devolved <coughs> nation should play in making trade policy. Now, a lot of European policy is going to become foreign trade policy now, uh, and we have a mechanism for the involvement of the devolved in making European policy, but we don't have a similar mechanism for foreign trade deals. Okay. Thank you, Kavina. Um, I, I want to pick up directly on the, that point that um, Professor Keating was just uh, share, sharing with us. I mean, what, what we're trying to understand, as far as I understand it, is um, the, the extent to which this committee should give recommendations to Parliament about whether to give consent to this bill which is going through Westminster. And th that, that legislative consent process applies um, not to all Westminster legislation, but, to le to, but only to, le to Westminster legislation that pertains to devolved as opposed to reserved matters. So can we just 
make sure that we've got a clear understanding about how that legal and constitutional landscape looks before we go any further. Um, as I understand it, this is a bill which is uniquely concerned with international trade. Is that correct? Yes, it, it is correct. Um, it's important well, that you. S well, I mean, the, the, the record won't pick up the fact that you're nodding. So if you could say <laughs> yes, it would be it would be helpful. I would say yes with uh, a caveat, which is, it says the the trade bill concerns international trade agreements and includes agreements which mainly relate to trade. We don't. There's no definition as what mainly relates to trade. So you will see in the written evidence provided that, uh, doctor, uh, by Professor Lang that that could deal with environmental protection agreements. Uh, so it's quite wide in its code. So it depends what you define as an international trade agreement. But the, the opening line of the long title to the bill is that this is a bill to make provision about the implementation of international trade agreements. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and do all the members of the panel agree that international relations, including treaty making, including the making of free trade agreements, are matters that are reserved to the United Kingdom in the United Kingdom's constitutional order? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and do all the members of the panel agree that there is no legal requirement in the United Kingdom's law, including under the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act or any other provision of statute, uh, for the United Kingdom government to consult with devolved administrations um, uh, um, about treaties? Yes, that, that, that is absolutely true. But on the other hand, we have an emerging con set of conventions around legislative consent for uh, matters that impinge upon devolved responsibilities. That's the tricky area. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, th and that area is being extended, and it's that boundary, really, that we ought uh, to be thinking about. I fully about. accept that that's a tricky area, but I just want to understand how the tricky area relates to the, to, to the constitutional and legal underpinnings of the United Kingdom Constitution, because there has been a lot of talk with regard to the Withdrawal Bill that certain provisions of the Withdrawal Bill don't respect the devolution settlement. And I just want to make sure that we are respecting the devolution settlement. And the devolution settlement says that international relations, including international trade, are matters that are reserved to the United Kingdom Parliament. The question I wanted to explore a little bit more with Michael Keating, where, because he raised it in his evidence a few moments ago, is clearly the United Kingdom is going to want to negotiate a number of free trade agreements with other countries around the world uh, that are multi-government um, jurisdictions whether federal formally or, or not, including the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, India, and others. Um, what can Michael Keating and other members of the panel tell us about how those multi-layered government, those multi-layered jurisdictions, federal countries, if you want to use that phrase, um, and navigate the relationship between what is done at the federal level, which in our case would be the UK level, and what is done at the sub-state, what is done at the sub-state level, which would be in our case here? Well, there's two, two obvious cases for that, one of which is in Belgium, which of course is part of the EU, but so-called mixed treaties like the Canada deal required national ratification as well, and so we know that required ratification by the, uh, the regions as well as the Belgium national government and almost came unstuck yeah. there. Uh, that, that's potentially a time bomb in Belgium, but they always managed to get around it. And the other one is the case of Canada, where the issue has never been resolved in the Constitution, but in the CETA agreement, it was agreed that the provinces would be involved in this because there may, uh, when the CETA came to be ratified in Canada, be a constitutional problem about the federal government ratifying provisions that impinged on uh, provincial jurisdictions. So it does arise anywhere, but I don't have an example of a country where it's actually been resolved. Okay, thank you. There was a, during that question session, Professor Keaton, there was a, a but that was coming through in terms of the legislative consent mechanism process. Yeah. Could you just expand, or anybody else who would like to expand on that? Because that's the primary purpose of this committee, is it obviously for this bill is in that area. So could we just expand your concerns uh, in, in that regard, please? Well, well, the UK government has already said that this bill will require legislative consent for certain of its provisions. Uh, that is consistent with our understanding of the civil convention. We don't know what's going to happen with the withdrawal bill, which is the really big test uh, of that. The UK government suggesting it may with amend the withdrawal bill so as to take uh, notice of, account of, the reservations of, of, of the Scottish and Welsh governments who are not recommending consent to their respective legislatures. Uh, we know that, as the Supreme Court has told us, that that's not enforceable as a matter of law. We, we, we know that. But the question is, is that part of our understanding of the Constitution? Uh, and I would answer that, yes, it, it, it probably is, but, but how those are resolved is something, again, that's never been tested. 
Does anybody else want to reflect on that, Andrew? Perhaps I can just say a few quick words in response to the intervention. Thank you very much. So in relation to consent and then in relation to other countries, so just very quickly, just to repeat what I think is already in, in the written evidence before you, the, the, the three key issues in relation to consent are the level of scrutiny where there are significant changes to existing agreements. I, I think that's a serious issue. The second is perhaps less serious. It depends a little bit on how exactly it's implemented, but this question of ambiguity as to the scope. So I think that's an issue. And then the third has to do with the limitations on the devolved powers which are in the schedule. And, and that, I think, is well understood, so we don't need to go into that. But the, the, on the question of other countries, I, I, just, I would say just a few points. One is that, of course... Uh, much depends on the domestic constitutional arrangements in that country. So all of the different comparative countries have a slightly different domestic constitutional arrangements. But I think it's fair to say that in all of these countries that we're looking at, there's an increasing recognition that even where there is no formal role for sub-national parliaments or sub-national authorities in approving or have no veto, it's at power, uh, no veto powers and so on, it's actually in the interests of the national government to have a full, uh, to have consent, to have full consultation and so on. I think there is a recognition of that. Um, and also it's in the interests of the FTA partner country. Um, and so one will see pressure uh, for that. Uh, and, and also I think one of the broad lessons to be learned from these examples is that it can be very important for there to be at least one formal <coughs> choke point, as it were, whether it requires formal acceptance by a subnational parliament, whether there is some formal requirement for a subnational parliament in the setting of the mandate, or at least one point in the process where a subnational parliament has a formal power. Uh, I think that can be quite important. Uh, just last question before we go to, to Ivan. Just, I, just, I just want some of this stuff on the record. Previously, in our interim report as a committee, we said that we could not support a legislative consent as far as the EU withdrawal was concerned, unless it was amended or changed in some way to you know, deal with the concerns that we had. If that bill was not to, to be amended, um, uh, and, and it obviously has an impact then on this bill, um, what would your view be, what would you say to this committee if the EU withdrawal bill was not amended um, in the way that we expect it to be amended, what position we should take as far as this particular legislative consent on the trade bill is concerned, if you see where I'm coming from? I think it raises many of the same issues, <coughs> and, and so the position would, would be the same. Okay. Can I just, uh, I see other people nodding, but the same for Adam. Can we just make sure that people say something so it's on the record? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. So that's just, so we're, so we're clear where we are. Right. Ivan. Thank Trade you. Board. Thank you, convener, and thank you, panel, for um, coming along to talk to us this morning. Just following up <coughs> I'm on the, the approach that Adam Tompkins took, uh, took earlier, and I suppose coming at it from a different direction, um, would you all agree that the, uh, the way the devolution settlement is structured, um, it states clearly that what is not reserved is devolved? Again, you can see yes, it would be helpful. Uh, y yes, yes, right. but, it also, but, but it also says <coughs> that none of this affects the competences of the UK Parliament. Mm -hmm. So the UK Parliament can ultimately have the last word, notwithstanding that clause. Sure, sure, but that's but the, the, the devolution settlement states clearly that what is not reserved is devolved, and clearly there's a list of things that that are not reserved, um, including agricultural, fisheries, health, education, transport, etc., which by definition therefore are devolved. Um, can you talk us through how you may see, and some of this has been referred to in some of the papers, free trade agreements could impact some of those devolved areas. Um, and you might want to reference international examples, and I think you mentioned Professor Lang situations where um, devolved uh, parliaments have been challenged um, because of uh, uh, requirements that were in free trade agreements, etc., or where it may constrain the ability of the devolved administrations to operate in devolved areas. Just. Um in the area of procure procurement, uh, for example, if you read the trade bill in conjunction with the EU withdrawal bill, one of the advantages that you have from leaving the EU is that you have an additional level of regulatory flexibility in setting your procurement system, because presumably you will no longer be required to comply with the EU uh, regulatory framework. 
and to the extent that the UK is successful in, in acceding to the GPA, the standards, the regulatory framework perhaps provided by the GPA is much lower than that of the EU. So that gives you some wiggle room in terms of how to craft a Scotland procurement system. But with the restrictions that are currently in the withdrawal bill and the trade bill, as I've read it, that would mean that no modifications would be possible in, under for retained EU law unless it's done by, by, by Westminster. So what is a devolved competence would essentially be taken up by Westminster, right. meaning that that benefit, that regulatory flexibility that you would gain from leaving the EU is lost and taken up by Westminster instead. So that's one area where I can see an issue. So perhaps, uh, so perhaps I can say just two quick things. Mm -hmm. So one is that <coughs> uh, there are certain chapters in FTAs which, are, which have headings which are, direct, which are directly related to vol power. So there's agriculture and, and mm -hmm. so on. But there's also, and this is really the point that I wanted to make, general principles within FTAs such as non-discrimination such as the requirement to accord foreign investors fair and equitable treatment and so on in investment chapters, which in principle apply to all forms of regulation at whatever level, and so don't exclude any particular area of regulation, therefore by definition include devolve. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's those sorts of general principles where you see uh, in particular cases coming in respect of actions by subnational authorities in investment cases, and, but also to a lesser extent in trade cases. Okay, I mean, to, to take an example, um, if we look to the health service, for example, where there's a different approach to the involvement of excellent investment, perhaps, in the rest of the UK to what there is in Scotland, um, you could envisage, there could be an, a situation where a free trade agreement is signed at a UK level that enables foreign investment to come in to the health arena um, that could therefore be imposed in Scotland um, because it was agreed at a UK level. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's possible of universities or other public services as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So following on from that and, and kind of changing tack a bit, um, what kind of role should the Scottish Government have in your view um, in negotiating trade deals now and in the future? So I'm, uh, well, I mean, this is uh, for all of us, I imagine. Um, but feel, uh, feel free, Andrew, on you. Oh, okay, so... Um, so I think we should distinguish between uh, a number of different functions. So one would be analysis, which I mentioned in my, uh, uh, which I mentioned in my written evidence. It, it might, it, it's important, even though it's soft. I think it's important, and I think there's a, 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 to some extent, an urgent role in building up capacity for that at the Scottish level. Second is the question of the negotiating mandate. I think careful thought needs to be given to. Um, the respective roles of the UK, of the Westminster, and also the devolved authorities in setting negotiating mandates. Um, I think that's very important. The third is oversight through the negotiations. Uh, so actually, I maybe there are five. The, the, the third is consultation in terms of public consultation at the Scottish level. I think that's important to establish frameworks which are independent of the, of the UK ones. The fourth has to do with consultations, intergovernmental consultations, and setting up a framework for that. And the fifth has to do with the ratification, and, uh, ratification slash implementation, which are different processes, but, but which are at the back end. And, and whether or not a formal, what kind of formal role, if any, ought to be given uh, to, the, to, the, to the Scottish Parliament and the devolved authorities generally. And each of those headings, we can discuss specific proposals and so on. But I think looking ahead, those are the five key issues that one needs to think about in terms of a future framework. I think, as I said before, I think, in my view, existing arrangements there may be a good case for a somewhat streamlined process, actually, in relation to a number of existing FTAs. And so I think one might have a set of different recommendations for that. And so perhaps just fi the final point I would make is in response to an earlier question. Actually, I think there probably is a good reason to separate out in different bills or in different venues a treat treatment of existing FTAs from, from a fu future FTAs. And so it may not be the best idea to, to combine them in a single bill. They're, to some extent, they're quite different. Anybody else want to pick up on that? Are you quite content with it? Well, well the, the provisions for Westminster scrutiny and ratification of trade deals are really inadequate, problematic as, as well. So this parliament would not be alone in, I think, in, in, in criticising that. And 
uh, asking for this to be opened up to much greater scrutiny. We're, we're, we're going to come back in a bit more detail. I think Patrick Harvey wants to go to that area. But first of all, Ash Denham, you still got some questions yeah. around f the framework of how this is all going to be yeah. dealt with? Yeah. yeah, I'm quite interested in the idea of intergovernmental relations and how you know those might be developed in order to maybe underpin or maybe facilitate this somewhere, this sliding scale between you know consultation or full involvement of the devolved administrations in you know ongoing trade negotiations. So. I mean, coming through in the papers, and I mean, this committee has taken evidence on this before. We know that UK IGR is considered to be quite inadequate currently, um, but internationally, um, there's a number of useful templates that you know could be potentially um, of interest to us if we wanted to to develop that. Obviously, this is open to the full panel, but um, particularly Dr. Miller Arija, you mentioned um, specifically the Canadian example. Um, can you give us um, a kind of an overview of the sort of facets of that system as it regards to trade negotiations? So it's, it's usually held up, the Canadian system, as the most effective and successful form of intergovernmental cooperation in the area of trade. And, and the way it works is that at the very top you have a joint committee which is known as the Sea Trade Committee and it's uh, composed of high-level trade representatives from both the Canadian federal government and provincial governments. Mm -hmm. And they will meet on a quarterly basis and discuss any issues which arise with respect to trade negotiations. So that's any issues that from the decision to actually initiate trade negotiations uh, to any problematic areas of the negotiations as they're ongoing. The committee itself is supported by subcommittees which deal with the technical issues, mm -hmm. as long as those technical issues relate to specific areas of provincial comp competences, mm -hmm. so agriculture and procurement, for example. So they'll deal with the technical, boring aspects of trade policy, and then if there's anything more controversial, that it's flagged up to the Sea Trade Committee. In addition to that, you also have a very um, intense level of transparency in, the, in how they carry out these trade agreements. So the federal government will regularly inform the provinces uh, and regularly submit uh, negotiating draft texts mm. so that... Uh, the provinces can review them and then submit their observations, put forward their interests, their suggested amendments. Um, and as you've heard, you know, trade representatives from provinces have in some cases been allowed to actively engage in trade negotiations. So the most recent example was the EU-Canada CETA, but that, that was actually at the request of you because the EU had previously been burned in trade negotiations with Canada where they... They said, look, we can't make um, liberalization commu uh, commitments in certain areas, in particular procurement, because of the provinces. So they wanted to take the middleman out of the way and deal directly with the uh, provincial representatives. And it worked very well. well the, uh, the, the deal got done anyway. It worked so well that Canada tried to replicate that system in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but there the U.S. rejected it. So even if you have a system in place which allows for representation of subnational entities like devolved authorities, you're still relying on the goodwill of your counterparts. So that's something to bear in mind. But what this system has done is it's allowed the federal governments and the provincial governments to carry out the negotiate trade agreements in a relationship of mutual trust and cooperation. Mm -hmm. But perhaps more, most importantly, it's, a, it's forced the devolved, sorry, the provincial governments uh, to take ownership of Canada's trade uh, policy, to take ownership of these trade agreements. Because they're actively in, in involved in the process, they also have to sell the final outcome of that process to their constituents. Mm. So this whole process, rather than being a an irritant, an obstacle to trade negotiations, mm. it's ended up enhancing the democratic legitimacy mm. of those agreements. But one thing, and I think this is something that's been touched upon by, by the other members of the panel, we have to understand that the Canadian system works in Canada because of very specific <coughs> political and constitutional factors that are unique to Canada and which not be, will, will not be easily replicated here in the United Kingdom. So in Canada, you have a very strong federal system where power is diffuse. Provinces, you know, one of the unique factors... Uh, features of the Canadian constitutional system is that provinces have the exclusive competence to implement international obligations. So say Canada negotiates a trade agreement which relates to procurement, which is a provisional competence, as they tend to do. The provinces have, in theory, the right to refuse to implement those provisions in their ter territorial jurisdiction. 
So in Canada, the federal government relies on provincial cooperation to get these trade agreements through the line. Mm -hmm. So the provinces have a great amount of leverage in these trade negotiations. And that's why you have this uh, high level of cooperation between these two levels of government. Uh, that's not necessarily the case here in the UK where power is not diffuse. In fact, the legal sovereignty is concentrated at the hands of Westminster. Uh, so simply replicating the processes uh, and the institutional frameworks that you have in Canada, here in the UK, won't necessarily lead to the same outcomes. You would probably need to go beyond that uh, by making you know, cooperation legally binding, which I don't think is the case as things currently stand. Yeah. Just a couple of points about, about Canada. Yeah, I agree with everything that Billy has said there. Uh, one is that there's a great deal of consensus in Canada about trade policy at the moment. There was not in the 1980s when I lived there. It was very controversial, but now there haven't been there are provincial interests, but not differences in the principle of, of, of free trade. Uh, and the other is that Canada has a lot of experience negotiating internal free trade deals because you don't have trade amongst, amongst the provinces. So they've recognized this as a problem for a very, very long time. And that mechanism then is being used to try and get agreement on international free trade deals, taking into account the provincial concerns. Uh, I just had three ancillary points, not really about the substance, but just to say, um, uh, firstly, that I think there is um, that this is actually a moment where having a proactive proposal in the near future would make a big difference. I, I think it could really set the, the stage for, for discussions going forward. Second is, um, I think, in, in addition to having actu considering the actual institutional issues, I think it's really important to... Um, build support for the, I think, just generally true idea that it is better to do trade policy this way. Mm -hmm. And one way of doing that, and this is why I keep coming back to the question of analysis and capacity, mm -hmm. one way of doing that is to begin to feed into the process to show what can be done here to build that analysis, to feed it in and to show what constructive role can be taken. And then the third point is... Um, we can talk forever about the particular institutional arrangements for consultation, but probably the single most important thing to provide the impetus for genuine consultation would be to have a formal role in terms of approval or setting of the negotiating mandate. Because once you have some kind of blocking power, then of course, of course the consultations are very, very important. Yeah. Okay, so you've outlined a couple of things that you think should um, happen in the, this UK, particular UK setting. Because obviously, um, Billy, you mentioned that you know the Canadian system wouldn't necessarily be able to be, um, you know, would work here. Um, would any other members of the panel like to just outline maybe briefly the, the key points that they think that should um, become part of this new IGR system for the UK? Well, we can we start with Sangita then? Well, I would suggest that there should be a clear mechanism that uh, that the Scottish Parliament should propose to. To Westminster as to how they are going to interact. So it has to be, there has to be, now for this, the Scottish Parliament has, again, as I go back to Andrew's point, we, that capacity has to be built and impact assessments have to be done in greater detail. Mm -hmm. Now take the example of procurement. I work on procurement. It's very important and that is a devolved power. So for procurement, the Scottish Parliament will have to work out, as I have mentioned in my written evidence, Great, you have to go into greater detail, find out what is the precise role of Scottish firms bidding for project, bidding, bidding for contracts in the EU, in third countries, what, and what are the other firms that are bidding in Scotland. Most, one, one important point that Scotland will have to think about is how are they going to replicate the EU TED system, the tender, the tender database system? Because as if one wants, if the UK wants to join the GPA, then they have to start thinking about uh, a, a tender's database. So the and most importantly, you have to start estimating what is the size of the procurement market, what are the barriers that are being faced by Scottish firms in third markets, because these are going to be important not only to negotiate the GP and also what entities you would like to open up, what you would like to keep aside. So these are important not only for GPA, but to also negotiate with the EU and most importantly with third countries with who you have partnership, with who the UK has partnership through the EU, but also the UK is proposing to have a new deal with them. Mm -hmm. So capacity is really key, and this is act, and then this is going to lead to civil society interaction, and this is how I suppose uh, a, a system of interaction will be set up. So it's essentially a process of e evolution we are looking at here. Well, 
Anything else from the government comments? No. Ash, are you okay? Andrew, I think, wants to come oh, Sorry, I, I think you mentioned just key points. Well, I, I mean, I think the one, we can, we can take a number from, from the existing model. So one would be a requirement, a legal requirement to update it, during negotiations to provide information to relevant parliamentary committees and so on. I think that's important. Um, and then some, some kind of formal structure for regular ongoing meetings around trade policy issues, um, um, you know, modelled on existing structures, but, but backed up somewhere by, when I say a formal role, I think I misspoke in terms of a blocking role. I mean, uh, some kind of formal role, whether it be hard or soft or whatever, but some kind of formal role in the process from setting a negotiating mandate all the way through to ratification and implementation. said about trade capacity and just to give you an example in terms of what's happened in Canada is that the provinces invested a lot of resources in building trade capacity to the extent that today it's not uncommon for the federal government to seek out their advice on areas that fall within their competence because provinces are in some cases deemed to be more qualified. Mm -hmm. So I mean there's no point in having a cooperation system in place if you do not have the intelligence and the capacity to engage in the process. In the absence of the constitutional environment which would give devolved authorities the power to shape trade negotiations, whether that's through ratification by the Scottish Parliament or an executive power to implement uh, the obligations, which is of course excluded in this bill, for example, then I would, go, I would just echo what Professor Lang said, which is you need formal and possibly legal, legally binding structures of cooperation. Now, Neil, we've covered a fair bit around the CETA arrangements, and do you want to still ask your question at this stage, because it's probably the right time to do it, I think. Yeah, it was just, <clears throat> well, we've already touched on um, Wallonia and the, and the trade agreement there, but just uh, any, any further reflections on, on what happened there and the, co you know, the consequences of having uh, similar powers for Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland? Well, the, the difference in the UK, of course, is the asymmetrical constitution. We come back to this. There's, there's only devolution in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and it's difficult to imagine uh, each of those having veto powers over uh, trade agreements. That, that might simply not be acceptable to Westminster. On the other hand, mere consultation may not be enough either. There's got to be something. The mechanism would probably be based on something like the Joint Ministerial Committee on Europe, which is the only joint ministerial committee that's had a continuous existence because it has something to do. Uh, and it's very important that committees should have something to do. It's being criticised because it, other, otherwise they just, they just fade away. This is what happened to the domestic ministerial committee. People just didn't turn up anymore. Uh, this one would have a lot to do, certainly while we're negotiating free trade agreements following uh, a Brexit. The question, and I don't have a clear answer to this, is exactly what... Uh, instruments would the devolves have available if they were ignored? Mm -hmm. how, how, ma how, how, how many levers would they have to make sure they were taken into account? We don't have a federal system like they have in Canada. We have asymmetrical devolution. Uh, something has got to be done to make sure that, they are, uh, that, that their views are taken into consideration, at least. Yeah, sure. Well, I would say that the clock is ticking away and we really do not have the time. So. We these structures have to be put in place ASAP, and we have to start thinking what kind of a transition measure are we going to do to address the problem that's looking at us in the face. Andrew? Just a couple of very quick points. No, I mean, I think in relation to the Wallonia case, um, while the Wallonian parliament did uh, perform a very important role in that process, I think it has given rise to probably quite reasonable concerns about the credibility of the EU as a negotiating partner, the ability of, of, uh, of the EU to negotiate the kinds of agreements that it needs to. And so, so I, w I wouldn't rule out a similar arrangement in relation to trade agreements, but there are a range of possible arrangements anywhere between the full veto power to mere consultation. One can imagine a formal requirement that a resolution be passed in devolved authorities expressing a 
approval or disapproval, and then it would be non-binding, may not have a formal role, but at least it would be required. One can imagine a practice of consent. One can imagine that an agreement be put before Parliament for debate, or, or, or whatever, a range of different things which would at least provide serious political checks on the process and, 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 and opportunities for debate and expressing of a view, you know. Um, and then, so. Okay. And I know we've got visitors from Wallonia tomorrow, so maybe I can ask them mo yeah. this question. Um, but is that, what were the reasons why they objected to the, the, the CETA deal? And, and did they get changes as a result of their, their vetoes? My recollection is that they had some concerns about, first of all, commitments made in the agricultural sector. So uh, in terms of tariffs on specific products, I can't remember which agricultural goods, uh, where they had clear defensive interests. And also there were a lot of concerns raised about the investment protection chapter that's included in the CETA. Uh, you know, international investment law is, is heavily criticized because of the perception that it constrains regulatory autonomy of, of countries and so they wanted to, to make substantial amendments not just in terms of the investment protection chapters which included obligations on for example the fair and equitable treatment standard but also on the isds system so the invested arbitration clause that was included in the CETA. <coughs> yeah. and, and in respect of the investment in the concerns about investment they played an incredibly important and 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 useful role in that, in that process. I guess if one were designing it from scratch, one would hope that those concerns were raised earlier in the process rather than later, and so it was a front-loaded consultation rather than that. Yeah, Adam's got a supplementary in this area. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kavina. Just a very quick supplementary on, on the really, really interesting things that you've had to say about Canada and, uh, and Belgium. Uh, are we to take it that Canada and Belgium are not representative um, examples of what federal countries generally do? I mean, it seems to me that you're presenting them, I just want to make sure we've understood this correctly, that you're presenting them as outliers, as kind of, as it were, kind of extreme examples. Canada, you, you, I think, Billy, you said that Canada is the kind of, you know, the, the, you know, the, the leading example of, of the involvement of provincial governments and legislatures in the making of international um, trade agreements that Canada is, is subject to. And that, that certainly that nothing like this happens in the United States, does it, where the Commerce Clause comes in and says that this is an exclusive um, federal uh, competence. Um, is, is, that, is that correct? I mean, you're not presenting Canada and Belgium as representative of what, you know, mature federations do. There's a, there's the, a real spectrum. Yeah, th there are other systems where this, these types of processes exist. So if you look at, for example, Germany, they have a federal system where the land they have a huge role in shaping foreign policy. Um, I think it all depends on the federal system. So mm. you gave the example of the United States. One reason, in principle, why... Uh, states in the United States don't have much of a say is that their interests are formally at least represented by the U.S. Senate. Yeah. So they have a bicameral system with a house which is there to represent the interests of uh, the states, whether they do or not is, is another matter. But it's there, which you don't have here in the United Kingdom, of course. So every system is different and you have to accommodate for those differences. Thank you. Patrick, the role of parliaments, I think you want to cover. Well, yes, I, I do want to come on to, uh, good afternoon, uh, I want to come on to the, the difference between the role of governments and parliaments. But before that, I, one other question occurs to me about the, 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 the governmental role, particularly, and it, it relates to some of what we've discussed already. Whether in relation to simple copy and paste uh, recreation of existing trade agreements, should that come to pass, or the creation of new ones, many will include some form of investor state dispute arrangements. Now, if at some future point under one of those arrangements, the Scottish government had taken some action within devolved competence for the protection of public health or the environment, for example, uh, and that became subject to such a, a dispute, who represents the state in that kind of situation? Is it the devolved administration which has taken actions for its devolved purposes or is it the UK government which has responsibility for trade and which has signed off the trade agreement? Uh, who is it that represents the state for the reasons that it's taken, the actions that it's taken? Uh, and if, may, correct me if I'm wrong, Professor. Uh, in the United Kingdom, devolved authorities do not have an international legal personality. 
So if there was an issue concerning non-compliance with an international obligation derived from a treaty, from a trade agreement, then it would be the UK that will be held liable for the failure to comply with that agreement. And also, it is, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. No, you go. No, no, I was just going to say, and also, the lead, those leading the case would typically be at the national level, with a variety of different mechanisms for consultation and involvement in on, an, uh, on a case by case basis. Yeah. So, so in in that kind of situation where where the Scottish government had taken action on devolved competencies to pursue a policy that was not shared by the UK government in domestic terms it would potentially be voiceless were it to be challenged uh, in, in terms of, of trade agreements. This is why we have been suggesting that it's important to have some kind of a regular interaction between the, between the Scottish Parliament and Westminster so that okay. we do not come to such situations in future. Yeah, I mean, I would just qualify that. You're talking about a relationship between the Scottish Government and Westminster rather than the Parliament. Uh, let, me, let me move on to the role of, of Parliament um, because we've had quite a lot of really useful discussion about uh, examples where devolved or sub-state entities uh, have a, a role in whether the approval of the beginnings of a, a trade negotiation, uh, the, the, the remit and, and, and mandate for the negotiation process or approval of the, the final agreement that's, that's, uh, that emerges. To what extent is the, the norm that those devolved or sub-state uh, powers or, or decisions are governmental as opposed to parliamentary. Uh, and I wonder if you could reflect also on the role of European parliamentary scrutiny uh, of trade agreements, which we will then, if we're outside of the European Union, be without. To what extent are those parliamentary scrutiny functions replicated uh, at UK level, uh, or perhaps example of other European democracies which are not part of the EU, do they have parliamentary authority on these matters, or are governments acting in executive Working functions uh, rather than having parliamentary scrutiny and, 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 and authority? Uh, that's a very long question, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the point, I, I think the answer is it's, it's mostly part governments. Parliaments have a very weak role. One reason given for this is that there's a lot of confidentiality in international trade agreements. I'm not convinced by that argument generally, but it's an argument that is used uh, because, in fact, we, we, all this stuff leaks out anyway. I mean, we know what's <laughs> going on in the Brexit negotiations, although it's supposed to be terribly secret. There are some examples in, in, the, in the Nordic countries, particularly in Denmark, in relation to European policy where a similar or analogous issue arises. There is a, a, a very good system for parliamentary scrutiny and parliamentary mandates before going into negotiations. Okay. But generally speaking, this tends to be executive dominated. Um, i just reflect on whether it might be possible to ask Spice to, to, to give us more information about that, uh, uh, that Danish example, uh, if, if that would be helpful in, in the future. I think, um, I think there's also there's a former committee report which actually covered this area as well, because I, I was a member of that committee, so I'm sure we can get that evidence as well. That'd so. be great. Uh, in an earlier discussion, I used the example of, of TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and the fact that European, European parliamentary scrutiny uh, had been a really important part of the movement that was criticising and challenging aspects of, of TTIP as it had been proposed. Um, if the trade bill passes in its current form, you know, I, I asked Scottish Government officials uh, this and, and got an official answer, but I wonder if you would reflect on uh, to what extent would that same degree of challenge be possible uh, under the terms of the trade deal where a, a, a trade agreement such as TTIP to be proposed? Uh, would we have any level of, of ability to use parliamentary scrutiny uh, to do what was done successfully uh, against TTIP? Based on what I've seen so far, I think the UK Parliament would struggle to would exercise struggle. that level of scrutiny because reading at the explanatory notes, you'd be subject to the Const Constitutional Reform and Governance Act, which actually goes doesn't go as far as a full-on ratification procedure, which is really the basic standard when it comes to approving trade agreements. So I, I, my first concern would be with Westminster mm -hmm. 
uh, before we even get to the question of whether devolved parliaments uh, have any say. I, I don't think uh, you know Westminster will have that sort of power that Wallonia had. And would this bill be capable of achieving that if changes were, were made to it? Is, 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 the, is the scope there to make changes to this bill to achieve a, a, an acceptable level that would mean parliaments don't struggle to do this? If, it, if significantly amended, yes. So you could add provisions which require <coughs> full-on ratification. I would say, and I would agree with the rest of the panel, that ratification on its own currently is no longer deemed uh, adequate, fit for purpose to mm -hmm. informing uh, negotiation and so on. free trade agreements which deal with regulatory issues which can mm -hmm. be very politically toxic any anymore. What you need ideally is a system where parliament or parliaments, parliaments and plural. other stakeholders mm -hmm. are involved from the very beginning, mm -hmm. consulted, there's cooperation, so that by the end of the process you get an outcome which hopefully reflects the interests of everyone. That's a very difficult thing to achieve, but that's how you maximize societal buy-in. That's how you maximize mm -hmm. uh, the chances of the agreement being ratified. And there are lots of different models you could <coughs> look at to replicate here in the UK, the EU being really very much at the forefront of this in terms of transparency and cooperation. And uh, just very quickly, in terms of specific changes that might be imagined to the trade bill, in terms of giving the UK Parliament a role, uh, one would be to modify it so that implement so one would be at the implementation stage to require primary legislation rather than secondary legislation, and the second thing would be to modify the Kruger Act in respect of trade agreements requiring UK Parliament uh, ratification, either for and of course this bill is only existing FDA, so either for all existing FDAs, though I'm not so sure that that will be a strong case for all of them, or some subset defined by reference to the degree of significant substantive change to the existing FDA. Do you know? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Murdo, I think you a, a question this area as well, and I'll come to Willie. I think you've. Yeah, just, just thank you, Camino. Just, just, a, just a brief follow on to some of the things we've been discussing. You've, you've all talked quite a lot about the need for improved intergovernmental relations. How could that be strengthened by improved interparliamentary relations within the UK? And are there models from other jurisdictions around the world where that happens well that we could look at? As a good model, uh, you faced a lot of criticism concerning the lack of transparency, the lack of involvement of national parliaments, and they've reformed the system significantly so that national parliaments are uh, informed and have an opportunity to debate about uh, during the negotiation process, not just at the end of the process. Not all parliaments take up the opportunity, yeah. but those who have, have impacted on trade policy. Uh, so there are models available, yes. Yeah. And they also want to reflect on that. Are you quite happy to go with that answer? Right. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. Willie? Much, Kandina, just to pick up on the, the issue about uh, scrutiny, I'm quite concerned on what we're hearing. I mean, you're saying some, several of your submissions that this process isn't fit for purpose. Are you getting any sense uh, from the UK government that they are engaging positively, proactively to try and resolve these issues? Because I think you were saying, Professor, that, that, that there was an urgency to get some of this work done at the moment. So we're expressing quite a lot of concerns around the table here, or some of us are. Is there any sense that you're getting that there's a willingness to engage to resolve these matters? There is urgency because Brexit has got to be done within a short period of time. We still don't know quite what that time actually is, uh, but there's an urgency. The danger then is precedents are set through this process will then become part of the constitutional arrangements uh, for future trade deals because other trade deals will be coming down the road. And so it's important to get it right at this stage even though time is very short. Yeah, but you get any sense that there is an engagement process, a two-way engagement process taking place yeah. that yeah. is going to meet in the middle, perhaps, and get a resolution? Or are you not getting that sense? Uh, I wouldn't know. I'm just an academic. So, uh, <laughs> uh, th I think there was at one point an acknowledgement from government that there would be something beyond the trade bill. I suppose that 
the light touch approach to parliamentary scrutiny in the trade bill is justified by the fact that these are trade agreements which on the whole have gone through the parliamentary scrutiny process at EU level, although the trade bills also covers trade agreements that have not been ratified. So like the EU Canada CETA, for example, hasn't been ratified and this would be rolled over under this trade bill. So that's an agreement that hasn't gone through the full scrutiny process at EU level and at the national level because it's a mixed agreement but it would be subject to a very light touch ratification process under the trade bill, so that would be problematic. There's also the fact that uh, we're not just talking about copy-pasting these agreements, so by the government's own admission, there are substantive, substantial changes, sometimes new amendments, so when you're talking about issues like investment protection, you know, and ISDS, that could be very problematic. Um, so I'm not even sure that the light touch ratification process is justifiable in this trade agreement, given that we may be talking about sig significantly amended trade agreements by the end of the process. But certainly for those trade agreements which would be negotiated by the United Kingdom after it leaves the EU, for example, with the likes of the United States and China and India, you would hope that there would be a more, a more intense level of parliamentary scrutiny. And that would require, I think, an, another bill, at the very least, to regulate that. Okay. You were talking earlier about, about the many different reasons why there might be an inadequate level of, of consultation um, between different governmental levels at the moment. And to the extent that it's driven by an overwhelming workload and, and too many issues, then one can imagine that kick-starting consultation would uh, be best done by commissioning some studies, identifying some sensitive issues, and, and then beginning a conversation with your own, with one's own set of issues. You know, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Emma, I think you had one specific area you wanted to ask a question of Professor Sangeeta Korana. Am I right? It's actually uh, Professor Lang, but okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's in your submission, um, you talked about... Uh, the UK's position in the WTO uh, and referred to EU-wide maximum permitted domestic support ah. for agricultural producers. Um, I'm interested in that. You know, I'm, I should probably remind everybody I'm CABSEC Fergus Ewan's parliamentary liaison officer, but agriculture is interesting because when we took evidence at the European Committee, ag negotiations and trade was always done last because it's really difficult. But I'd be interested to know what do you mean by... Um, EU-wide maximum permitted domestic support? So one of the obligations that the European Union has undertaken has been to cap uh, at a certain level its maximum permitted domestic support, subsidisation to, uh, to agricultural producers. That is defined in terms of a quantity which is EU1, which is across all of the EU current EU28. And so in principle, that will have to be divided. That will have to be modified by the EU27, and then the UK will have to have its own maximum cap. In, so that's an important issue for the UK to define its own maximum cap. And then, uh, so that will involve establishing a domestic support, a framework for domestic support for agricultural producers domestically. And then that will involve serious negotiation amongst the devolved authorities. But it, uh, I suspect that, the, that Westminster will take the view that that will have to be a pan-UK position. Um, so that's, an import, that's a very important question. Now, l let me just say that perhaps the WTO aspects to that are a little less significant than they might appear, partly because the European, uh, excuse me, the, the WTO agreements permit certain kinds of subsidies and as it happens, a lot of the European subsidy programs fall within this particular kind of box of permitted subsidies. So actually, the Europeans are not yet even close to their cap because of the way they've structured their subsidy programs. And so there may well be room to split the cap in a way which keeps everyone happy. But that's the basic position. OK, could, I, I guess as a splitting of funding, I mean, we have 85% less favoured areas in Scotland compared to the 15% south of the border, so there's going to have to be some interesting negotiations to support the rural farmers I, I in think our it's area. A, I, think it's an absolute, I think it's an extremely important issue and one that will be touched upon uh, in terms of negotiation of WTO commitments, but also FTAs going forward. <laughs> extremely important, yes. Okay. Okay, thanks. thanks. Well, I think that's everybody, am I right in saying that? Well, thank you very much. That's been a fascinating session. Um, 
think many of us are learning about trade policy, trade negotiations, trade agreements to a degree that we would never had to be involved in before, and I certainly found it very educational from my perspective. So can I thank you very much for coming along this morning, and I will now close this session of the Finance and Constitution Committee.